General Martin Agwe, thank you so much for your time. Would you begin by telling us a little bit about your background? Well, I joined the Nigerian military in 1970, uh, just immediately after the Nigerian Civil War. And I had my training both in Nigeria and abroad. I did my staff college training in uh, Cambly in UK. And on my commission, I was commissioned into the Armored Corps. So I did attend the US Army uh, Armored School in Fort Knox, Kentucky. And um, at home, I had some training in our National uh, Defense College and went back to United States to do a master's in national resource strategy at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. Um, in my, during my service, I've been lucky to command from a platoon to company to battalion and a brigade commander. And in 2003, I was appointed by uh, was appointed as the chief of army staff. That is the commander of the Nigerian army. That position I held for three years before I was made the chief of defense staff in 2006. And that was my last job in Nigeria. And outside Nigeria, I have had a tour of duty in Sierra Leone as the deputy force commander in the UN mission in Sierra Leone. And I also went to the UN headquarters to be deputy military advisor at the Department of Peacekeeping in New York. And my last job in the military before I retired last year, December, I was the last commander, force commander of the African mission in Sudan. And I was the first uh, United Nation African Union uh, hybrid force in Darfur. So you did the transition from being part of the Nigerian military into the UN. Was that a simple move? Well, it was not quite easy. Uh, I agree that one had some training at home and abroad and talked about peacekeeping. But uh, there were really no organized training as such to really uh, give you an insight of the challenges you are going to face in the new job. Unlike what is happening today where you have senior mission leaders courses for possible future leaders to attend. Some of us didn't have that privilege, we didn't have that opportunity. So it was uh, on the job, I'll call it on the job training. We got in there, you try to find best practices and from yours and other people's experiences, you keep moving. That was what really happened. It wasn't easy. Um, I remember particularly my first mission experience in uh, Sierra Leone. It was a very demanding one because that was when the UN had suffered a very heavy setback by the rebel kidnapping almost uh, um, 600 peacekeepers. So it was a real setback and a real uh, troubles uh, time for the mission. And we got there without any preparation. It took me actually three months, really, to understand where I was and what I was expected to do. But after that, we were able to go forge ahead, got some ceasefire arrangement, and got disarmament done in uh, Sierra Leone. That today, Sierra Leone has gone, uh, since I left, they have had three elections. So. Do you think that on so many fronts, Africa is probably the UN's greatest challenge? Well, yes, you see, first and foremost, there are a lot of expectations, uh, especially in the trouble zone. Uh, one, 
the world itself expects the UN to do some magic. Uh, the host nation, especially those that, uh, that need protection, the women, the children, the elderly, that really need protection, feel that UN must provide them the protection. And yes, the UN have tried, but you cannot be everywhere in a country. So once a little thing happens and the UN does not respond quickly, you will find a lot of condemnation, a lot of challenges and criticism. You see, another big challenge is how you bring together uh, the military from different nations with different background and training, different culture, and then you bring those military, you bring police from different way of policing from their nation into working together in a mission. And then you have civilians also from different culture. So to bring all this together under one umbrella. And then outside the mission, you have the country team, like the humanitarians who have been working there and development agencies that are working in those countries and in those areas. For all of you to work together, have the common agreement and common focus to achieve the goal is not very easy. It's a real big challenge. And that's why I still believe that we are getting it right now. Now that we are beginning to have integrated training, especially for those who will be leaders, that is very important. Why is that important? Can you give us some examples? Well, um, it's so important because it's, it's one, for you before going, you know the possible challenges and you know the possible areas. For example, when I went to Sierra Leone in 2000 as a deputy force commander, I really didn't understand the relationship between the humanitarians and the peacekeepers. I didn't understand why uh, some NGOs will not want military protection for, uh, for their convoys or for, or for their um, activities. So, but now I do. And if future leaders also have the opportunity to, ex to know the working system of the NGOs, the do's and don'ts of the NGOs, the, those of the UN humanitarian organizations, and then the mission itself, and to understand the relationship, the working relationship between the country team, the humanitarian, and the mission uh, is very important. So that is why I feel it's very, very absolutely important that people get to know this before they even go forward for, to take the position of leadership. There has been so much of a resounding theme through this conference and all the people that we've spoken to about the importance of doing your homework, doing your research. How do you set up the best training to do that? Well, the, um, one of the, the generic training we have is uh, very good to prepare people. But however, every mission has its own peculiarity. Uh, even if it is even if it's all the missions in Africa, each one of them has its own peculiarity. And, and that is why uh, it's also uh, important that just before the leaders leave for a mission, that they have an opportunity to know more, to study a little bit more, research more, and if possible, visit the uh, area where they are going to walk. Um, for the other workers, especially the troops, because the, the first people to learn always are the military. Uh, it's important for the young man, look at a young 18, 19, 20 year old uh, chap who have just left school. Now you are taking him to a foreign country where he has never had a feel of what it is. It's very important that you give him a very clear picture of what is expected, what he's going to find there and what is expected of him. And uh, knowing fully well also that most of the training of the military 
as I used to say, is shoot to kill. That is what you are taught when you join the military. Now you are going for a mission. You are being told that even when people spit on your face, you should accept it and, uh, and you should use minimum force if at all you are going to use it. So you see the real challenges that you have to balance it up now to retrain and refocus uh, the troops before they go out. The next other thing is the equipment. You must give them the right tool to do the job you want them to do. So a lot of it appears to be about managing expectations, I suppose, not just in the residents of the home country, but also within your own people, your own forces. Yes. Well, yes, that, that, is, the, uh, uh, that is what makes uh, peacekeeping a very difficult job because there are too many expectations. Even your own home country that is sending you has its own expectation why they are sending you. The host country has its own expectation. The region where you are going to operate have their own expectation. And the international community that is sending you there also have their own expectations. So these are all the challenges and that's why it is very important, especially from the leadership level, that the leaders are prepared by whosoever is sending them, should fully prepare them to face the challenge they are going to. General Agwe, thank you so much for your time.